All right. And to everyone that is joining us later on, we want to welcome you to the small group and Bible study. Um, again, this is Cameron Bracey Ministry Small Group and Bible Study, and we join every Friday night at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, this week, we are going, or this week, really for the next two to three months, we will be diving into the book of Revelation. As we all know, we are going into a season, um, the season of atonement, and this is a season in which we know that Christ can possibly return. We don't know the day nor the hour, just like we don't know when the first drop of snow will fall, but we know the season in which snow comes and the Bible tells us we know the season in which the Lord may return. So without further ado, I think it is a perfect time, especially with everything going on in the world, to talk about the book of Revelation and to dive deep into it. So before we get started, let's go ahead and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. All right. We're kicking it off with Revelation chapter one. Just a reminder tonight, we are going through chapters one through three. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. I'm purposely doing that with the book of Revelation just so we can get a full understanding of everything that is being said. Um, the New King James Version, I think, does a fantastic job. Um, and it's what I was studying. It's the version in which I was studying this week. So that's where I'm going to be reading from. But if you want to follow along in any other translation, that is more than OK. So chapter one, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which much which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Already, I want to start here by letting you all know Revelation, the Greek word of Revelation is actually apocalypsis, which translates into apocalypse. It means a revealing or an unveiling. So in the book of Revelation, Jesus is revealing not only the things to come, but he's also revealing himself in this book. So everybody, you know, yes, this book is about the end of the world. Yes, this book talks about many things that are to take place, many things that are to happen. But even in the midst of Jesus revealing and unveiling all of that, he's also unveiling himself as the glorified king, as the son of God, as the one who is over all, the one who has victory. So that is what the book of Revelation is, is about. When you see the book of Revelation, when you hear the word revelation, you can just think about a revealing. That is what the book of Revelation is about. It is a revealing of things to come and a revealing of Jesus himself. In verse three, it, as it said here, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. When you read the word near, near can mean sudden. It doesn't always mean that it's going to happen right now or it's going to happen within the next five minutes. Near, when you see that word in the Bible, a lot of times it can just mean sudden, which is why we say we don't know the day nor the hour, which is why you'll see Later on, Jesus will talk about how he is going to come suddenly as unexpectedly as a thief in the night. Near means sudden. So these things that we're going to be talking about for the next two to three months, these are things that will happen suddenly. That's what he means when he says near. He also said one is blessed when they read the book of Revelation and hear the words of its prophecy and hold on to its words. You are blessed when you read this book. You are blessed when you study this book. You are blessed when you hear the words of the prophecy in this book 
because it is now preparing you for the things that are to come. I know a lot of people avoid the book of Revelation due to maybe a lack of understanding. A lot of people, a lot of people fear it. A lot of people have anxiety when they hear about the end of the world. But Jesus made it clear when you read this book, you are blessed. You are preparing your heart, your soul, and your mind for the things that are to come. So it's important that every believer they dive into this book. When I was just talking to my grandmother yesterday, she had even said how her first time reading the book of Revelation, just like many believers, it was very hard to understand. Some things were confusing, confusing. some things kind of left her with a question mark, but as she continued to read it, every time she reads it over and over, she has a better understanding. That is how we as believers are to really address the whole Bible. But just like anything in life, when you don't understand something, what do you do? You study. You, you, you try to read it over. You try to study. You try to prepare yourself so that, hey, I remember reading this before. Now it makes sense. Now it clicks. So I don't support the belief of, oh, because I don't understand the book of Revelation means I'm not going to read it. No, read it and hold on to the words closely. In verse four, we're picking up at verse four now. It says, John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne who are the seven spirits. That is something that some people ask when they read this verse. Well, if you look at Isaiah chapter 11, verse two, it says the spirit of the Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. Now, this does not mean that this is these are seven different spirits, but they are characteristics of the spirit of the Lord. So when when um, John writes about the seven spirits, he is talking about the spirit of the Lord, wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. You gain all of this when you study the book, when you study the Bible altogether. But when you read the book of Revelation, this is what you gain from it. You gain wisdom, you gain understanding, you are counseled. As you see, Jesus is going to counsel some of the churches that we talk about tonight. You gain might, meaning you gain strength from it, knowledge, and you also have a fear and a reverence for the Lord. When you read the book of Revelation, you should have an increase of reverence reverence for God, because you see that just like that, anything can happen. Just like we saw in Maui, Hawaii this week. I was just talking to my wife, Crystal, today about it. Just how a week ago today, Maui was basically like paradise on earth for a lot of people. It was a vacation spot. A lot of tourists were going there. Some people were probably there for honeymoon. Some people were probably there just as a, you know, a couple of, a couple destination. And today, Part of Maui is now burned to ashes. As you see again, it is sudden. It was something that happened just like that. So if we pick up from verse five, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. Jesus Christ is over all. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse seven, behold, he is coming with clouds and every eye will see him. Even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. This is telling us here, verse seven, if I pause here really quick, Jesus is coming. It's not a doubt whether he's coming. There's no question that he's coming. It's a matter of fact. It's a matter of truth that he is coming. Jesus ascended into the clouds. And just as he ascended into the clouds, he will descend from the clouds. He will come from the clouds with the clouds surrounding him. When he returns, he will return with the clouds. Now, when you study the Bible, maybe you may look at a commentary, maybe you may listen to a, a biblical scholar, you'll see that clouds can also translate into multitude of believers. So some believe that when Jesus returns, you're going to see a multitude of believers around him. You're going to see the angels. You're going to see those who were followers of Christ here on earth who um, maybe died before this time, and they are now in heaven with the king. They're going to be surrounding him. That is a common belief, and that is not a wrong belief. 
that is something that will cause the whole world to marvel. Like the Bible said, many in the earth, all the tribes of the earth, they will mourn. It's another way of saying they will also marvel. Some will be in fear. Some will be in shock. Think about those who may call themselves atheists or agnostics. They are going to see this wonderful man, this beautiful being the king of kings and the lord of lords jesus himself descend from the clouds he's going to come with the clouds and they're going to go oh my gosh i was wrong i was wrong about everything and jesus told us in matthew chapter 24 about his return so if you want to learn more about his return and the, and the things that will uh, basically prelude to his return you want to go to matthew 24 let's go to verse 8 Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. This is Jesus speaking now. This is in red letters. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. In verse 8, notice here in the entire book of Revelation, in verse 8, this is the first time that we hear Jesus speak now. This is his words. This is what John is writing, what Jesus said. Notice how strong of an introduction Jesus gave himself to. He said he is the alpha and the omega, meaning there is no one above him. There is no one that has authority over him. He is the beginning and he is the end. In the beginning, God was the word. You read actually in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word, what was the word of God? You know, and you read on how Jesus is the word. So Jesus was there in the beginning and he will be there at the very end. This is how he is introducing himself. He is making it known. I am omnipotent. I am omnipresent. Who is and who was and who is to come, the almighty. Jesus came before. Jesus said he was going to come again. And there's no doubt, like I said earlier, he is going to come again. He is the almighty. If we continue on with verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. I love it how John says there that he's a, our, our companion in tribulation and kingdom and the patience, meaning we're waiting for Christ's return. So many people are waiting for Jesus to return. They're anxious for his return. They're looking forward to his return with everything that is going on in the world today. When you are a follower of Christ, how can you not look forward to his return? Does this mean you sit around and do nothing? No, but you are looking forward to his return. If we continue on. So impatience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Just a brief background here. Remember John, the apostle John, he was persecuted in Greece. They tried to burn him. They basically put him in oil. They tried to burn him alive. He survived it. So then they exiled him onto the island of Patmos. Of Patmos. So we remember here that these letters, these writings are coming from Apostle John. And I was just telling my grandmother yesterday, the book of Revelation, the reason why you have to take time to study it is because when Apostle John wrote it, he didn't write everything so straightforward. There's a lot of coding in it, if you like to say. You have to really look at the language. You have to look at the words. You even have to, I was even telling my grandmother, you have to pull out other prophecies in the Bible for it to really make since John wasn't going to come forward and just say everything the way that we may have wanted him to, because at the time when he was in Greece, he would have been persecuted for that. And they probably would have taken these letters from him and, or these scripts from him. And as a result, we wouldn't have the book of Revelation today. So God was intentional on in how he spoke through John at this time. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord today, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, and this is Jesus speaking again, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now, a lot of people, we're going to go on tonight, beginning in chapter two, really, we're going to go into the seven churches that John is writing these letters to. A lot of people believe that the book of Revelation and Jesus rebukes and his encouragements was only for these, uh, for, were only for these uh, seven churches. I highly disagree. 
I believe that just as the Bible applies to us, as certain scriptures apply to us, all scripture really, as it applies to us today, even though it was said thousands of years ago, I believe that the words that were here in the book, that were here written to the seven churches, that they are also speaking to the churches today. His word is alive today and forevermore. Like Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never pass away. This is part of his word. So while it was at the time addressing these seven churches, Jesus was also speaking to every single church that we see today, which is thousands upon thousands and probably hundreds of thousands and probably millions. That is what Jesus was speaking to today. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. Now, this portion here is telling us how Jesus looked. John is writing out the description of how he saw Jesus. He saw Jesus now. He was clothed with this garment down to the feet. Girded around his chest was a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. When you see the word countenance, it is talking about the appearance of him. He was bright as the sun. John is giving us a description of how Jesus looks here. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me. Notice here that John says he fell at his feet dead when he saw Jesus. That is how much power, that is how much glory Jesus has. You cannot stand in his sight. You hear about it all the time. When we go before judgment day, the Bible says every knee will bow. That is how powerful the word of God is. That is how powerful the glory of God is. You will not be standing in his presence. You will be on your knees, which is why I tell people today, don't wait to get on your knees then get on your knees now repent now get on your knees and pray now doesn't mean that every single time you'll be on your knees no but you should show that honor even now don't wait until judgment day to do that you trust me not one being will be standing on judgment day so jesus went on to say do not be afraid I am the first and the last. So he's encouraging John here to not be afraid. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. So Jesus, he has power over life and power over death. He has power over it all. He holds the keys. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. So remember, the seven stars that he's talking about here, these are the angels of the seven churches that John was speaking to. This tells us today that there is an angel that is assigned to every church, which tells me there is an angel who is a witness to what goes on in every single church. So it doesn't matter what's going inside or what's going on outside. doesn't matter what truth or lie may be told. There's an angel who is a witness to how a church is being ran. Notice here, there's an angel for every church. Just as it was then, it's just how it is today. An angel for every church and an angel for every single ministry. That's how it is today. That's chapter one. If we go to chapter two, chapter two now goes into Jesus speaking to the seven churches. And the first church that we're going to talk about here is the loveless church. Now, I want to stay quickly here. Jesus knows the condition of each and every church. I am not talking about the financial condition. I am not talking about the number of people, the number of, of members, the number of those who attend, the number of those who may be subscribed on YouTube or follow on Instagram. No, I mean, he knows the condition of every church's 
heart. He knows their strengths and he knows their weaknesses. So you're going to see here in every seven churches where there may be a rebuke and where there's going to be encouragement. No church is perfect, but we will read here. There are two churches, as I will go into tonight, that Jesus actually did not have a rebuke for. He basically told them, stay encouraged, continue to stay on the path that you're on. But verses one through seven, we're looking, we're in chapter two now, verses one through seven, it addresses the loveless church. To the angel, verse one, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things say, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven gold lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Now, Jesus is talking about the strengths of the church of Ephesus. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and, and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Always, it's, I'm going to come back to that word, nevertheless. Remember that. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from when you have, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Remember that word, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This is Jesus' words to the church of Ephesus, which is also known as the loveless church. Just a little background, the church of Ephesus they worked hard. Notice Jesus said they worked hard. They were laborers. They were patient and they did not tolerate evil. There was no patience for evil. If you're for God, you're for God. If you're not for him, this is not the place for you to be. That's the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus, they were not afraid to test one who said they were an apostle, but isn't. It's no different than one than a church saying, hey, this person is walking in here saying they're a prophet, but are they? And when they test the words, when they test the teaching, when they go to the word of God to see, is this man or is this woman teaching what is biblically sound? If they're testing the doctrine, is it correct? If it's not, the church of Ephesus did not tolerate it. They weren't afraid to check one's doctrine. They ensured the gospel was the gospel. So the church of Ephesus wasn't for the prosperity gospel. The church of Ephesus wasn't for the poverty gospel. The church of Ephesus was for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You teach the word of God. You stand by the word of God. You live by the word of God. And guess what? The church of Ephesus was cool with you. They also worked without becoming weary. They, they had patience. They, they had perseverance. This was the church of Ephesus strengths. So notice here, Jesus addresses their strengths first. But in verse four, he says the word, nevertheless, when you see, when you see that word, nevertheless, it means in despite of that or despite of meaning, hey, you may have these strengths, but I also see these weaknesses here, which need to be corrected. Notice Jesus didn't say, oh, it's okay because you got this right. You can continue with these weaknesses here. No, if you are a church of Jesus Christ, you have to keep everything in order. While there may be imperfect people and imperfect leaders, it needs to be kept in order because this is a church of God. So it means the church had good, but there were some things they also needed to immediately address. A church may have some good to it. A ministry may have some good to it. But Jesus doesn't look past the corruption within. And that is how we as believers must also see, hey, if there's corruption, if there's things going the way that they shouldn't be, if there's some operations going on that shouldn't be going on, it needs to be addressed. Jesus addressed it and we should address it. What was the problem with the church of Ephesus? They had no love. There was no love in the church of Ephesus. And all the work that they did, Jesus made it known that they didn't do it out of love. It wasn't out of love. A church, a ministry, or leader, they can work hard. They can have all of these initiatives. They can do all of this good in the community. 
but that doesn't mean they love God or his people. It's no different than someone who is working a job, who spends 20 years on a job that they hate. They can just be doing it for show. They can just be doing it for the facade. They can just be doing it for things that do not matter, just for an image, just for Instagram, just for social media. Again, for things that do not matter. Jesus told them, you need to go back to that first love. You need to check your hearts again. You need to humble yourselves. You need to, you need to understand your purpose in doing these things. So I challenge everyone, when you volunteer, when you serve, are you doing it out of love? Do you love God's people? Are you willing to help the poor person? Are you willing to help the sick person? Where is your love? Do you have love in doing it? So Jesus talked about the first works. Remember, he said, repent and do the first works. But before they repent, what did Jesus say? If we look at verse five, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, you have to remember. I just talked about the prodigal son. He came to himself. His thinking got corrected. You have to remember where you fell from, where you came from. Then Jesus said, repent meaning turn away from those corrupt ways, turn away from the loveless way of doing things. And another way of saying it, just doing it carelessly. Oh, I gotta, I gotta do the offering again. Oh, I gotta, I gotta help serve here again. Oh, I gotta be here again. You're better off just not doing it if you're not gonna do it out of love. Repent and do the first works. What are first works when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to a relationship with God. Number one, you have to spend time with God in his word. You lose love, followers of Christ, Christians. We lose love for people. We lose love for God if we do not spend time in his word. Hence why we're doing this more and more, spending time in his word, diving deep into different books of the Bible. You have to spend time in his word. Number two, you must spend time with God in prayer. You cannot be someone who goes, once a week praying, or you only pray at church, because then that tells me there's six other days, or I'm even say six and a half more days where you're not praying, which tells me you're also not repenting, which means if you were to die and you didn't repent of the things that you may have done, you are now in trouble before the God Almighty. You have to spend God, you have to spend time with God in prayer. Number three, you must be joyful when you gather with your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the first works. This is where the church of Ephesus, this is where they failed. They lost the joy of gathering with one another. You know why? Because it came, it became a routine. Oh, I know sister Shirley is going to be over there. Oh, I know brother Michael is going to be sitting right there. Oh, I know the order of service. They lost the joy in it. Jesus said, not only did you lose the joy, you lost the love. There's no more love here. You have to be joyful when you got, when you gather with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And number four, you must be excited to tell others about Jesus. But notice how all of these things are in order. You won't be excited to tell others about Jesus if you're not even excited to gather with your brothers and sisters. It's no different than if you're married to someone, you're not going to be excited to tell other people about how beautiful uh, or how handsome your spouse is if you're not even excited about your spouse. You're not going to be joyful gathering with other brothers and sisters in Christ if you don't spend time with God in prayer. And you won't spend time with God in prayer if you don't spend time with him in his word because how do you know how do you even know how to pray what do you, how do you even know what to pray for if you don't spend time with him in his word it's no different than if you say brother or sister i'm going to pray for you but they never even told you what they need prayer for and yes the holy spirit can give you a word of knowledge but you have to spend time in his word those are the four works those are the first works of the kingdom everything else Everything else, I know everybody may say, well, I, I do lights, I do sound, well, I'm, I'm an elder, well, I, I, I serve in the choir, well, I'm, I'm part of the traffic ministry, I'm part of the children's ministry. Everything else is a condiment. It ain't nothing but salt and pepper, ketchup and mustard. Everything else, all of that, it's just a condiment. It don't matter where you serve and what ministry you serve or what you've done. Condiments are of no use if you don't have a meal, an entree, or any substance. And the first works is the substance. The first works is the meal. The first works is the entree. If we continue on, verse six, but this you have. So I love how Jesus, how he did things. There was 
he told them what he loved about him, what he loved about the church of Ephesus. Then he did a rebuke. Not only did he do a rebuke, then I love how after he did the rebuke, then there was another encouragement so that they just wouldn't be so down. Oh man, we got to do this. While he told them, repent, address this immediately. I also love this about you. He said, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. It's rare that you see in the word of God. I, sh I shouldn't say rare, but it's few times in the word of God where you see him saying he actually hates something. We all know about the seven abominations to God, which he hates. He tells us he hates it. One of them is gossiping. He hates gossiping. So he also says he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Notice here, he doesn't hate the Nicolaitans. He hates their deeds, meaning he hates their works. So number one, you have to ask yourself when you're reading this, because see, some people read the book of Revelation. And like I said, it's not one of those books you just skim through. You just say, oh, I read chapter one, I read chapter two. You got to really pay attention. You should be writing question marks. Who is this? What is that? Why did he hate their deeds? How are you going to know what Jesus hated if you never look it up? So who were the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans were a group of individuals who taught a demonic doctrine that told the church to relax and to befriend the world. That sounds like so many churches or so many ministries today. Relax, breathe. It's okay to do what the world does. It's okay to go to this wild party. It's okay to drink the same drinks they drink. It's okay to listen to the same music. It's okay to behave this way or to talk this way. Relax, just breathe. And it's in this doctrine where the Nicolaitans will actually cause you to suffocate if you just breathe, you just relax. Jesus said the way to heaven is narrow. The road to heaven is narrow. The Nicolaitans, they lowered their standards. They had an open mind. They were open-minded when it comes to things. You got to be careful when you hear churches and ministries talk, talk that way. When they say, well, we're going to be open-minded to this, especially when it comes to this pride agenda. When it comes, you know, well, I, 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 you know I'm not going to say I hate anyone or, you know, anything like that, and I judge it. But we know that God is against pride. That's one of the seven things he hates. He hates Pride. Proverbs has a whole chapter on pride and everything that follows it, which is nothing good. So they have this open mindedness. Let's be open to it. You hear churches today because they want to, they're trying to align with the government agenda because they have to receive government funding. They're going to be open minded about what the government is open minded. That is a way of the Nicolaitan. Number two, Nicolaitans entertained what was wrong. They entertain what was wrong. I don't care how cool it is. I don't care how new it sounds. I don't care how cool it looks. We are not as the body of Christ, as a church or as a ministry to entertain what is wrong. If it's wrong, it has no place in the house of God. It has no place in any ministry. This goes for Cameron Bracey Ministries. This goes for any other ministry or any other church. It does not have a place. You are not to entertain anything that is wrong. Number three, the Nicolaitans, they accommodated what God despised. The biggest word there for that is inclusiveness. Man tries to make inclusiveness sound so innocent. Satan has deceived so many people into saying, oh, well, you want to be inclusive here. You want to be inclusive that with that. I, I always tell Crystal, once you make a little room, I shouldn't say I always tell her, but I've told Crystal before. She knows I've said this. When you make a little room for Satan, he's going to take a big chunk out of that. He's going to bust his way through the door with it. You, the road is narrow. It ain't no highway to heaven. It's narrow. This is not an all-inclusive thing. People get offended when I say this. Heaven is exclusive. It's not all-inclusive because if it was all-inclusive, then you can live life doing whatever you want. That's not the case. Heaven is exclusive. Number four, the Nicolaitans, they entered into moral and sexual defilement. They were sexually immoral and they lowered their standards that, uh, uh, to man's morality and they didn't hold up to the standards of God, which is holy, which we just read a few weeks ago when we read, uh, was it Peter or James? Forgive me, I forgot. We just read it though. We are to live holy because the God we serve is holy. They lowered their standards. When anytime you lower your standards, you are now coming below holiness. 
I love how Rick Renner, there's a gentleman on YouTube, his name is Rick Renner. He identified what modern Nicolaitanism looks like. And I wanted to share this with you all. Number one, there's no emphasis on living holy and separation from the world. We have a lot of churches, a lot of ministries today who just emphasize doing things with the world, being a part of the world, looking like the world to draw them to Christ. That is not how it's supposed to be at all. We are separate from the world. The Bible says, while we may be in the world, we are not of the world. There's a difference. We are separate from it. We're a remnant. We're the body of Christ, not the body of the world. Number two, there's no emphasis on the doctrinal teaching of the Bible, meaning you have ministers out there who will say, oh, I just want to teach Jesus, but you never hear them teach about sin. You never hear them teach about repentance. You never even hear them talk about hell. How do you want to talk about Jesus or even say, I just want to speak the words of Jesus, but you won't even talk about the very same things that he spoke of. You got to test their doctrine just as the church of uh, Ephesus did. Number three, there's no emphasis on the absolute truth or absolute biblical authority. None whatsoever. It's, oh, we're going to waver here. Oh, we're going to bow here. Oh, we're going to do this. No, there's no emphasis on the truth or absolute biblical authority. And number four, there's no exclusionary belief that Christ alone is the way to heaven. I give all credit to Rick Renner here. He's the one who listed these four points, and I thought it was perfect for what he said. They don't believe that Christ is the only way to heaven. You've heard recently, I've heard recently, and even in past years, some celebrities say, Jesus, there's no way that Jesus can be the only way to heaven. You can go through, you can get to heaven through Allah. You can get to heaven through Buddha. You can get to heaven just by giving God some money. There have been celebrities who have said this, and churches have bowed down to this. Churches will speak against. Some churches won't even say that Jesus is the only way because they got a celebrity sitting right in their church and they care more about their money than they do their souls. Be very careful of that. Rick Renner said, when you have these four things, when there's modern Nicolaitanism in the church, this results in a powerless, weakened version of Christianity where sin is tolerated, Separation is ignored and the need for ongoing repentance is disregarded altogether. We must be very careful, ladies and gentlemen. There is power in the name of Jesus forever and always. We are not to tolerate sin. I don't care how seasoned you are, how long you've been saved. I don't care how well established the church is. Sin should not be tolerated. Does it mean that we won't welcome imperfect people? No, because we ourselves are imperfect. But it means we need to be holding each other to a certain standard. We need to understand that we are not of the world. And as a result, if you know a Christian, if you know a believer who is always cursing, who is always gossiping, Paul even said it, don't hang out with them. Because they're like yeast. They're like a mold in the bunch. You don't want to surround yourselves with them. And the need for ongoing repentance. There should always be repentance. You want to make sure that you are under uh, a, a ministry, under a church, under leadership who stresses repentance. I'm not talking about just giving an altar call and saying, Lord, forgive me on my sins. And then Monday through Saturday, you're doing whatever you want. I'm talking about true repentance. You turn away from your old ways and you face Jesus. That is the loveless church, the church of Ephesus. If we go now to verses 8 through 11, we're still in chapter 2. This is where Jesus talked about the persecuted church, which is the church of Smyrna. In verse 8, it says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. Notice here, Jesus is telling the angels to write this, because remember I said it before, there's an angel on assigned to every church. They're a witness against you, a witness for you. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty. And in parentheses, it's a, in parentheses, it says, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Jesus recognized the church of Smyrna by their works, their tribulation, and their poverty. This was a pleasing thing to Jesus. The city of Smyrna, now I'm going to shock you all here if you, you you can look it up for yourself. I looked it up. I learned all about Smyrna this week. 
the city of Smyrna and just a short synopsis of it, it was actually rich. It was a wealthy city, very well off. But the Christians there struggled. So if you were someone who identified as a Christian or as a follower of Christ, a follower of the way, you struggle as a result of the persecution they faced for being followers of Christ. So once that came out, once you said, hey, I'm a follower of, of, of Jesus, um, you know, I can't participate in some of these things. I'm not going to go to these temples. I'm not going to participate in some of the the, the paganistic things that are going on. They persecuted you. They came after your job. They came after your money. But notice here how Jesus loved them. Jesus encouraged them. Jesus at, commended them for this. Even though they looked poor on the outside, Jesus told them, but you're rich on the inside. Notice, ladies and gentlemen here, Jesus isn't impressed by any money that a church has. Jesus doesn't care if it's a $2,000 church, if it's a $100,000 church, if it's a $20 million church, if it's a $50 million church, you can be the largest church in the world, the largest church in Asia, the largest church in America, wherever. That does not impress Jesus. But he loved it. The fact that they had endurance, they endured. Jesus did not have a rebuke for the church of Smyrna. He only encouraged them. He knew he knew their works, the tribulation. They were always persecuted. He knew that they were poor. They were persecuted because they were followers of him. And Jesus let them know, you will have a great inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. He also knew the blasphemy of those who say there are Jews, meaning there were those in the city of Smyrna who considered themselves religious and said they were Jews and thought they knew it all. But they thought some of these Christians, per se, they thought these Christians were doing too much. They needed to relax. They needed to breathe. Jesus was just only some, some prophet. He was only some man that was just killed. They didn't believe it. Jesus knew that they are of the synagogue of Satan, which is basically another way of saying the church of Satan. And he told them, do not fear. And he also let them know you're about to suffer, but do not fear. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Notice in verse 11, he keeps saying, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. All of us have ears. You have two ears. If you have, a, if you have an ear, you better be listening. If you overcome this, you will not be hurt by the second death. Don't be shocked if we see uh, something similar to this here. And if we, if you know, if there was a letter written to the church of America per se, don't be shocked. If we start to look like the city of Smyrna, per se, America may look wealthy, may be rich on the outside, but don't be shocked if Christians are, are about to be persecuted because you won't affirm certain people's identities, because you won't affirm certain agendas, because you won't follow them. Don't be shocked if you're persecuted for it. But like Jesus said, don't bow down. Don't give in. Okay? Verse 12. We're going to verse 12, verses 12 through 17, and this is about the compromising church, which is the church in Pergamos, the compromising church. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, these things says, he who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where satan dwells so jesus told us here where satan dwelled then but i have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of balaam who taught balak to put a stumbling block before the children of israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the nicolaitans which thing i hate we talked about the nicolaitans before Jesus didn't hate the Nicolaitans. He hated their deeds. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Here goes again. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Mm. And I will give him a white stone and on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it hallelujah jesus identifies that satan's throne was or some people may believe it still is in the city of pergamos 
The city of Pergamos is a province in modern day Turkey. Now, some people believe that Satan's throne now dwells in what modern day would be, I believe it's Sweden, um, because uh, we're not going to talk about it so much here today, but there's an organization that goes by the name of CERN, and basically what CERN is trying to do is they're trying to have these uh, uh, atomic particles collide, and it just causes certain things to take place in the spiritual realm. What a lot of people don't know about CERN is a lot of the scientists and a lot of the individuals who work at CERN, they have actually reported having uh, hallucinations, delusions, and all of these things. It's a lot of evil things that are coming up out of CERN. If you look up CERN and you see some of the images that have come on some of their computer screens, they are demonic faces. And some of these scientists are so amazed and they're like, oh, we're gonna tap into this, but it's demonic and it's evil. That's a belief out there. I'm not going to say whether it's right or wrong. I hear all sides. I get it. It's not a salvation issue. But anyways, it was believed that the city was known where Satan's throne was because it had temples. So at the time, Pergamos, Jesus said, this is where Satan throne, Satan's throne was. And some scholars believe it's because it's where uh, the temples for both Greek and Roman gods, all of which we know are false. This, is, this was like a highlight of temples for Greek and Roman gods. Pergamos also had three temples dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor, the Roman emperor. So Jesus said here, hey, y'all better be careful down there. Do not compromise. The church of the, the church of Pergamos was under uh, a temptation to compromise. They must hold fast. Remember he said, hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr. You can read on who Antipas was. He told him the few things he has against them is that th there are those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols. We all know, like Jesus said, it's not so much important what goes into your mouth, but it's what comes out because what comes out of the mouth is what was in the heart. But he never wavered away from also what God said too. If you and I are aware that food has been sacrificed to an idol, as followers of Christ, we are not to eat it. We are not to eat the food that we are aware that has been sacrificed to idols. Now, some people may say, well, what if we didn't know? Then you're not in the wrong. Jesus makes that clear. You're not in the wrong. You didn't know. But if you are aware that it has been sacrificed to idols, you are not to eat it. That is what happened a lot in the city of Pergamos. Notice, remember, remember I said here, there were a whole bunch of temples for Greek and Roman gods. There was also teaching there that they could commit sexual immorality, meaning they could fornicate, meaning that they could still go to heaven even if they have sex outside of marriage, meaning they can still be close to God even if they continue to do all of these things that are sexual, sexually immoral. No, 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 no. That's a doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Notice what Jesus told them in verse 16. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The word of Jesus alone will do more destruction than any nuclear, nuclear bomb that we hear about today. The word of Jesus Christ, there was more power in his word alone than there is in any atomic bomb. He told them, repent, repent. It's a key thing. Repent of your sins. Don't give in to this lifestyle. That was the church of Pergamos, which is also known as the compromising church. Now we're going to go into verses 18 through 29, which is called the corrupt church. And here, this is the church in Thyatira. So in verse 18, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, these things says the son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Jesus is describing himself again. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. That's a compliment. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allowed that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. How graceful of a Lord we serve. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds. Jesus is constantly telling the churches to repent. I will kill her children with death 
and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you, I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put you, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him in the morning star. He who has an ear, again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. A lot going on here with the church of Thyatira. The church of Thyatira was known for their works, their love, their service, their faith, and their patience. Jesus commended them for it. He said, great job there, but I have this against you. You allow that Jezebel. Now, is this, is this the same Jezebel we read about in 1 Kings and 2 Kings? No, this is not the same Jezebel. This is not the Jezebel that was married to Ahab. Doesn't even mean that the woman he was talking about, doesn't even mean her name was Jezebel, but this is referring to the fact that there can be a spiritual Jezebel, like a, a woman who has characteristics of Jezebel. Jezebel was manipulative. Jezebel was sexual. Jezebel wanted to control. Notice that was part of Ahab's problem. He consistently listened to his wife who wanted to kill all the prophets of God. And as a result, it put Ahab in opposition with God. Jezebel called herself a prophetess. This Jezebel here, we don't know if she's the leader of this church, or one of the leaders, I should say, it could refer to the pastor's wife. There are some pastors out there, it's gonna be real. Their wives have a Jezebel spirit on them. They call them, they think just because they're the pastor's wife or just because they hold, they're married to the man of the house. They think that they can tell everyone what to do or how to do it. And they will never go to the word of God. That is a Jezebel spirit. Pay very close attention to this. They teach and seduce God's servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Basically, they do not care what you do. As long as you still come to church, as long as you give your tithes, as long as you do what they say, they don't care anyone else, they don't care anything else that you do. Do what you want to do. That is a spirit of Jezebel. Jesus noticed, he said, though, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Jesus is so graceful and he's so merciful. Even in this time, even in this woman who was doing wrong, he gave her time to repent. Then he said, indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Now, some read this and say, why would Jesus call someone to be sick? Why would Jesus chastise someone? We have to sometimes uh, see it as chastis chastisements are sometimes warnings from God. It's, it's his way of sometimes getting people to repent. Does it mean that everybody will repent? No, but it's his way of saying, hey, you need to understand that you are living a lifestyle that is not pleasing. For example, if you have someone who is addicted to drugs and they continue to do drugs and they know better, what happens? Part of chastisement can be that they now begin to have problems going on within their blood. They can begin to have neurological problems. They can, be, they, they, they can become easily ill. It's a chastisement. And God is saying, if you repent and turn away from the drugs, you will be better. I will help you. But I cannot do my work in you and through you if you continue to stay with the drugs. It's the same thing with people who may have sex with just any old person. Today, I just read on CNN how they're sending out more uh, sexual, you know, there's an increase in sexually transmitted diseases. And now they're trying to come out with more medications for it. Some people have illnesses that are related to the fornication that they are in. Some people have illnesses related to the sex that they are having outside of marriage. And they may go to God and say, Lord, heal me, Lord, do this. And there, it may be a chastisement of God's way of telling you to repent, come out of that lifestyle. He told them, they will go into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. This was the church of Thyatira, okay? Now that's chapter two. We're gonna go into chapter three here. Chapter three, last chapter for this evening. Last chapter for this evening. The first uh, chapter three, verses one through six addresses the dead church, which is also known as the church of Sardis, okay? The dead church. And to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, 
but you are dead. Be watchful and strength, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Jesus keeps telling these churches to repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Okay. The church of Sardis thought they were alive. They thought they were lively. They thought because they had everybody coming to every service. They thought because they had everybody coming to different shows. They thought they had everybody coming to maybe whatever performance, whatever service. They thought because they were just so packed and they had this, this aliveness that people were always talking about them. It's no different than maybe a church appears alive on social media. Maybe they appear alive on YouTube. Maybe they appear alive. Maybe it just seems, oh man, the, the spirit of God has to be on that church because of how lively they are. Uh-uh. That's superficial. That ain't God at all. Jesus here, he will walk into a lot of churches today that look alive to us and will say, you're dead. You're dead. You need to repent. And if you don't repent, I will come to you. I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. We may not go into detail about everything that went on in the church of Sardis. I, I would like to say that maybe they were compromising. Maybe they entertained things that should have never been entertained. But the thing is, they were they appeared to be a lively church. And Jesus said, no, they're dead. They need to hold fast to the word of God and they needed to repent. They needed to keep watch, stand, watch, stand guard. There were a few, though, in that church, like Jesus said, who were walking with him, who have not defiled their garments. But there were many. I want you to think about a mega church. Many who seem alive, but they are dead. But it's those few that maybe nobody knows. And maybe some people think, oh, they're too holy. They just think they're better than when really they're just walking a narrow road. They're walking along the narrow road. And they're the ones that Jesus will say, no, they're alive, but the rest of you are dead. Got to be very careful. We got to stop looking at things superficially. All right, that's the church of Sardis. The next church, which is known as the faithful church, the church of Philadelphia, verses seven through 13. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and, and, and shuts and no one opens. Notice here how Jesus just, he, he describes himself so perfectly. I love it. He has the key of David. He opens and he opens and no one shuts and he shuts and no one opens. You have no power over Jesus. He says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. And no one can shut it for you have a little strength, but you've kept my word and you have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, meaning the religious folks, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those who think they're better than the, the people who celebrate false gods, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. He's speaking of a spiritual thing here. He's speaking in eternity and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, in a few weeks, that hour that is to come, that trial that is to come. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. I want to say something really quick here. All of us have a crown and we may not be able to physically touch the crown right now or physically see the crown right now, but there's a crown that each and every one of us have. You do not want to lose that crown. Like Jesus said here, he can take your crown. And trust me when I tell you all, you don't want to lose your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem 
which comes down out of heaven from my God, which we read about in the millennium. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the church. This is the second church and the last church that received no rebuke for the church that received no rebuke. The church of Philadelphia, they, they didn't receive any rebuke. They only received encouragement. Jesus was encouraging them to continue to persevere. And last but not least, these are the last uh, eight verses tonight. Chapter three, verses 14 through 22. The church of Laodicea, also known as the lukewarm church. Everybody talks about lukewarmness, but until you study it, you don't even know what it really means. Here we go. Verse 14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things say, says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I love how Jesus in every single writing, he's introducing himself, just he's perfect. I know your works, that you are neither hot, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. A little backstory here, if you don't know about Laodicea. Laodicea had a water. They were surrounded. Um, they weren't surrounded by so much water, but where their water came from, Laodicea's water came from a hot spring, okay? But by the time the water got to Laodicea, the water was lukewarm. Anybody who's probably drunk in lukewarm water before, it's not, it doesn't taste pretty good. That's what Jesus was letting them know there before too. Lukewarm, it's not good. It's just like uh, today, we can describe it to coffee. You hear people say they either want ice, ice cold coffee or they want um, hot coffee. But when the coffee reaches that temperature that is in between cold and hot, a lot of people say it doesn't taste as good. My grandmother can probably speak to it. It doesn't taste as good. This is what it this this is what Jesus was saying to them. This is why he used this analogy because it made sense to the church of Laodicea. If you're lukewarm, meaning if you're not on fire for me, some of you are just cold. Fine, you're cold towards me. But if you're not on fire, or if you try to play in between, you have people who say, "Well, you know, I can do this," and but but then you know, I, I'm I'm still a Christian, so I may not do this, but. You know, I'm gonna go over here and gossip, or I may not, I may not gossip, but I'm gonna still be prideful. Or I may not be prideful, but I'm gonna curse just here and there. You know, God knows my heart. God knows me. You're lukewarm. And Jesus makes it clear when you're lukewarm, he will spit you out, he will vomit you out of out of his mouth. Vomit, and basically another way you could say he will gag. You make him gag. Everybody on this call today and everybody watching this later on, you should be on fire. For God, if you're not, he will vomit you out. That's the truth. Verse 17, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Ooh, that's a little aggressive, don't you think? I think us reading this, some people will say, Jesus didn't say such a thing. It's right here in red letters in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. He said, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, yet you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus is not Im impressed by one's wealth. One's wealth doesn't promise them entry into the kingdom of heaven. You can look wealthy physically, but be in poverty spiritually. This is why I always say the amount of money you have, it does not matter to God. It does not impress God. And guess what? It has no weight whatsoever on what your judgment will be on judgment day. It has no weight on your salvation. It has no weight on your eternity. Jesus did say, hey, when you are wealthy, I'm a firm believer. Just like being poor doesn't make you any closer to God. Being rich doesn't make you any closer to God. Being poor doesn't make you further away from God. Being rich may not make you further away from God. But Jesus also knew too that when one has a lot of money, there's a lot that comes with that, a lot of responsibility, a lot of accountability, and your chances of loving that money increases, which is why he said it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter to the kingdom of heaven. So this tells me here, the more money you have, the harder it may possibly be. You have to be careful. You want to make sure that you don't love your money. 
Jesus told them here, you think because you're rich, you think because you're wealthy. He's speaking to even those people today who walk in different churches all over America or all over the world. They think because they have a special seat, they think because they drive a BMW or an Audi or a Lamborghini or a Range Rover or a Bugatti, whatever they may drive, they think because they have these luxurious vehicles, they have these luxurious homes, they have these luxurious clothes, these designer clothes, and they look good and so man's eye, they may look blessed and they may look very prosperous, but Jesus said they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It doesn't mean nothing. It means absolutely nothing. He says, I counsel you to buy from me. Notice here, Jesus is counseling the rich folks what to buy. Buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. What is eye salve? Eye salve is like an ointment. It's a treatment for what was also known as a wind back then, but it's like a lump in your eye. Um, if you've ever seen someone with a sty, let's say uh, my younger brother, he had a sty for a little bit. It's an ointment. It's a treatment that one would put on their eye so that they could see. This is what Jesus was telling them here. You need eye treatment. Your, 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 your eyes, your spiritual eyes, they're blind. This is what Jesus was telling them. They're blind. You only see the flesh. You don't see the spiritual. You don't understand the spiritual. Anoint your eyes. As many, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Just talked about his chastisements just a few minutes ago. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Notice Jesus here. He said here, I love. If, if he loves you, he's going to rebuke you and he's going to chasten you. If Jesus doesn't rebuke you, if Jesus doesn't chasten you, it's because he doesn't love you. But he's going to rebuke everyone. He's going to chasten everyone because he loves everyone. He tells us, be zealous and repent. He's telling them again to repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Why did he say all of this to the church of Laodicea, to the, what, which is also known as the lukewarm church? Because the lukewarm church thought because they have money, because they have fame, because they have food, because they have large homes, because they all of their basic needs are being met and probably exceeding that. They thought they were in good standing and righteous standing with God. We even confuse that today. Many believers confuse that today with being in right standing with, with God. You can be well off physically in the flesh serving Satan. You can have the biggest house. You can have the nicest clothes. You can have the nicest shoes. You can have the nicest car. You can have all of those things and be serving Satan. Being well off is not equivalent. Being well off, I should say, in the flesh physically is not equivalent to being right with God, to being righteous, to being in right standing with God. Jesus was telling them here, you need to open up your spiritual eyes. You need to get off your high horses. You need to stop looking at your money. Your money has become your God. Repent, humble yourselves, be zealous for me, be on fire for me. Y'all, we got through the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Does anybody have any questions, any um, questions, comments, anything like that? Anything you would like to say? Anything that I may have went over that I probably didn't clarify too much, that was probably confusing. I can clarify that for you right now. But um, that's basically the, the detail that I was going to go in with it today. I thought this was good timing with it. Um, but yeah, that's the seven churches that Jesus rebuked, that he said something to. Um, he encouraged them. And uh, yeah, so I hope everybody learned something today. Um, next week, if you plan on joining us or if you're here tonight, next week, we are going to go over chapters four and five. Chapters four and five. Chapter four talks about the throne room of heaven. And chapter five talks about the lamb, which is Jesus, when he took the scroll and talks about how worthy the lamb is. So that's what next week is going to be. Next week probably won't be as long but we're going to go into them we're going to break down a few things that i talked up that i've spoken of in uh, chapters four and five which is basically a visual again of heaven it's john's vision of heaven so 
tonight. We went over chapters uh, one, two, and three. Share this recording. This recording will be out there soon. As soon as it downloads to the cloud, I'll have it out there and share it with everybody. But I want to thank every single person who is here tonight for joining us. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, for those of you that are watching later on, I want to thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. Uh, leave a comment. Share it. The book of Revelation needs to be taught, like Jesus said. Bless, blessed are those who read this book, who hold tightly to it. Don't forsake this book. Trust me, it takes time to understand it. It, take, it, it. it took me hours. I was talking to my grandmother yesterday. I told her just for the first three chapters alone, it took me hours this week to really get a great understanding and to really break down and to go into the history of why Jesus said certain things and why there was a rebuke. It's not something, it's not a book you just skim through. It's not one of those books. I don't like to say that about any book of the Bible, but this is definitely not a book you just skim through or you just look at the surface. You got to really dig deep into it. You won't understand it unless you dig deep into it. So without further more to say, I will see everybody uh, next Friday at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Again, I'll see everybody next Friday, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. I love you all. Tracy, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. It was great to see you for the first time. I'm, I'm excited to see you on. So excited. I love you. Uh, but yeah, we'll see everybody next Friday at 8 p.m. Y'all be blessed. Have a safe, blessed, wonderful weekend. All right. Bye-bye.